The C++ compiler is the most complicated compiler in the world. Let's see why. So we first have to start with the C compiler. So C seems very simple to pass. It doesn't have many keywords, like this, for example. It doesn't have too many keywords. C also has minimal abstraction and a small grammar. However, this is not the whole story at all. First of all, we have compile time macros. So macros in C are text replacements performed before compilation. Do something like this. So we define size as 100, and everywhere where size will be, will be replaced with 100. So when the, after the preprocessor, you'll see 100 instead of size. You can make them functions, something like this. After the preprocessor, we'll simply just insert this wherever you put that. You can also shoot yourself in the foot by doing something like this. If while, so every time you put if, you're actually putting a while loop now. And header files are based around macros. They just paste the code in place. So if you do this and then include it, it simply just paste this file wherever you put that. Weird syntax. C syntax is generally fine, but there are some really weird things. For example, this. You can put the pointer at any place here, and they're all valid. You can also do this, whereas a is a pointer to an integer and b is just a regular integer. Or you have this, which is really annoying. The top one is an array of five pointers to integers. The second one is a pointer to an array of five integers. And the third one is a pointer to an array of five pointers to integers. The main difficulty in passing this is the fact that the array part comes at the end. So you literally see int pointer name and only then do you see the array part and you think, oh, it's an array of pointers. And then there are function declarations, which can look like this. And f is a function with an int parameter that returns a pointer to a function with a double parameter and returns a pointer to five integers. There's also this problem. So the problem here is it's very awkward to pass. You have to look ahead. So in the first example, you see int identifier, then open brackets. You think, okay, it's maybe a function declaration or maybe it's the function body. We don't know. You have to look all the way to the end and see the semicolon and think, okay, this is a forward declaration. On the second line, you have to go all the way to the end to see the open brace. And then you see, okay, this is actually implementation. And then on the last line, you have to go all the way to equals to know that it's actually a declaration of an integer. And then you can have all of this. These are compiler flags, and it doesn't matter what the order is. You can put them in any order. And you have to pass this. You also have to pass assembly directly in some situations, like this. So passing C is hard because the preprocessor has to replace code before compilation. Error messages are hard to generate after the preprocessor. A difficult syntax that doesn't have specific order requires look ahead and contain assembly and many compiler flags and has to convert code to assembly or machine code directly. So C++ is built on this. So any problem that C had, C++ also had because of backwards compatibility and historical baggage. I'm not saying that C is a broken language. I'm saying that C isn't perfect and has some problems. So the C++ compiler inherits all of the difficulties from C because it requires backwards compatibility. C++ then adds Classes with constructors, destructors, inheritance, polymorphism, interfaces, user-defined conversions, and more. Templates that allow code generation at compile time. Exceptions for error handling. Function and operator overloading. Namespaces. Thousands of inbuilt types and more complicated syntax. And modules. First, classes. Classes seem trivial to implement, like this example. So all this is is simply just a struct with members, and then the compiler will generate this function with the, with the parameter called this, a reference parameter this. That's all it does. That's actually pretty simple to do. However, as soon as we add something more complicated, like operator overloading, this gets really more complicated. Or we have the modern C++ way of doing it. So the problem here is that plus equals depends entirely on whatever the operator overloading is. And it depends on what the type is, and the compiler needs to go into every type to see what the actual operator overload is for this function, and then change the code depending on that. That's what it needs to do. And it also means it's not clear exactly what plus equals actually means. It could do anything in theory. So SEDC out, the standard way of printing in C++, actually uses operator overloading. That's why it's using the bit shift operator, which is a very weird thing to use as a way of printing. So this means that any operator, any of these, could potentially do anything and the compiler needs to always check what this is doing. 
Then we have the default constructor, the regular constructor, and the destructor. So when we write something like this, the compiler needs to insert the default constructor for us. Let's say we're going to create three files and do something with them. So these have early return situations, and the compiler needs to insert the destructors in every situation. It will look something like this. So it does it for us in every situation when needed. This also works when there's an exception. So moving on to exceptions, C uses macro values as errors, whereas C++ uses exceptions, which is a completely different thing. And how exceptions work is it basically will return from every function until it finds a catch block. If it never finds a catch block, it simply just ends the program and shows you the error message. So C++ needs to support both error handling methods. Namespaces. So normally this will be a redeclaration of A and B, but because there are namespaces, it isn't. But how does this actually work? What the compiler actually does is simply just mangle the name. So it will put one A and mangle the letters in between so they don't conflict. And then the compiler needs to work out which one is actually referenced when you use them. Uh, function overloading works in a similar way. So say we have two add functions. One takes in double and one takes in long. The compiler needs to basically mangle the names because they both have the same name. And then it needs to work out which one it's calling depending on the return type and the parameters you put in. And there are some situations where it's ambiguous and the compiler can't work it out. So you need to specify in some way. And then C++ syntax is a bit ridiculous as well. So you have all of these different ways to declare variables and they're all valid. This is simply just a lot of situations you need to cover when passing code. And then it also has iterators, which for some reason will use operator overloading. I don't know why. Of course, it doesn't just use a function call. It's got to use an operator overload. And then C++ also adds references as an alternative to pointers. However, these aren't clear at all at the call site and need to be resolved by the compiler. So here function 2 takes in a reference to an integer and we put in x, which is just a regular integer. So it's not clear at the call site and you need to go actually into the function definition of function 2, work out that the parameter is a reference and then make sure that actually is a reference when generating the code. So the C++ compiler needs to go into the function definition of function 2, see that it's a reference, and then change the value of x accordingly. So it's not passed by value. And now we get to templates, which is probably the most complicated part. So templates look something like this, and this is a way of doing generics. Templates are compile time code generators. When you call this function with a specific type, that function version needs to be generated at compile time. This is most commonly used for generics, but has many other uses. You can do something like this, where we set the value at compile time and actually recursively calls itself. So this will do something like this. It will call it with 5 and 4, 3, 2, until it gets to 0. So the second template has no input, and whenever it's 0, it will default to that. So when it gets to 0, it will stop and not go forever. So all of that happens at compile time. So the value of x will actually be 120. We have type traits. Uh, here, a different function can be used based on the type of the input. This is known as substitute failure is not an error. You can have variadic arguments, meaning any number and type can be inputted. You can do dependency injection with policy-based design. So whatever you put in will actually change the behavior of the class. You can also put templates inside templates. So one of these uses std vector, the other one uses std list. Now C++ error messages. So they're notoriously bad. Why? Why are they notoriously bad? Well, if you put together everything I've said in this video, you can see why. C++ error messages are so crazy because macros in the preprocessor will change code before compilation. Templates will generate code at compile time that you didn't write. Namespace names will be mangled. Overload function names will get mangled. The compiler will insert appropriate function calls, constructors and destructors into your code. And by the time there is an error message, your code could look completely different. So here's the C++ passing nightmare if we put all of this together in one crazy example. Something like this, which is a monstrosity. But the C++ compiler has to be able to pass this. So this combines self-referencing templates, recursive macros, operator overloading, return type depending on however you pronounce that, conditions and dec type, fold expressions, infer types with auto, variadic template parameters, and macro lambdas. So if you put all that together, 
That's why C++ is the most complicated compiler in the world.